Section nine of Old Greek Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Luna. Old Greek Stories by James Baldwin. Section nine Cadmus and Europa. One The Bull. In Asia there lived a king who had two children, a boy and a girl. The boy's name was Cadmus, and the girl's name was Europa. The king's country was a very small one. He could stand on his house top and see the whole of it. On one side of it there were mountains, and on the other side was the sea. The king thought that it was the centre of the world, and he did not know much about other lands and people. Yet he was very happy in his own little kingdom, and very fond of his children. And he had good reason to be proud of them, for Cadmus grew up to be the bravest young man in the land, and Europa to be the fairest maiden that had ever been seen. But sad days came to them all at last. One morning Europa went out into a field near the seashore to pick flowers. Her father's kettle were in the field grazing among the sweet clover. They were all very tame, and Europa knew every one of them by name. The herdsman was lying in the shade under a tree, trying to make music on a little flute of straw. Europa had played in the field a thousand times before, and no one had ever thought of any harm befalling her. That morning she noticed that there was a strange bull with the herd. He was very large, and as white as snow, and he had soft brown eyes, which somehow made him look very gentle and kind. At first he did not even look at Europa, but went here and there, eating the tender grass which grew among the clover. But when she had gathered her apron full of daisies and buttercups, he came slowly towards her. She was not at all afraid of him, and so she stopped to look at him. He was so handsome. He came close to her, and rubbed her arm with his nose to say, Good morning. She stroked his head and neck, and he seemed much pleased. Then she made a wreath of daisies, and hung it round his neck. He looked at her with his soft, kind eyes, and seemed to thank her, and in a little while he lay down among the clover. Europa then made a smaller wreath and climbed upon his back to twine it round his horns. But all at once he sprang up and ran away so swiftly that Europa could not help herself. She did not dare to jump off while he was going so fast, and all that she could think to do was to hold fast to his neck and scream very loud. The herdsman under the tree heard her scream and jumped up to see what was the matter. He saw the bull running with her towards the shore. He ran after them as fast as he could, but it was of no use. The bull leaped into the water and swam swiftly away with poor Europa on his back. Several other people had seen him, and now they ran to tell the king. Soon the whole town was alarmed. Everybody ran out to the shore and looked. All that could be seen was something white moving very fast over the calm blue water, and soon it was out of sight. The king sent out his fastest ship to try to overtake the bull. The sailors rowed far out to sea, much farther than any ship had ever gone before, but no trace of Europa could be found. When they came back, everybody felt that there was no more hope. All the women and children in the town wept for the lost Europa. The king shut himself up in his house and did not eat nor drink for three days. Then he called his son, Cadmus, and bade him take a ship and go in search of his sister, and he told him that no matter what dangers might be in his way, he must not come back until she was found. Cadmus was glad to go. He chose twenty brave young men to go with him, and set sail the very next day. It was a great undertaking, for they were to pass through an unknown sea, and they did not know what lands they would come to. Indeed, it was feared that they would never come to any land at all. 
Ships did not dare to go far from the shore in those days, but Cadmus and his friends were not afraid. They were ready to face any danger. In a few days they came to a large island called Cyprus. Cadmus went on shore and tried to talk with the strange people who lived there. They were very kind to him, but they did not understand his language. At last he made out by signs to tell them who he was and to ask them if they had seen his little sister Europa or the white bull that had carried her away. They shook their heads and pointed to the west. Then the young men sailed on in their little ship. They came to many islands and stopped at every one to see if they could find any trace of Europa, but they heard no news of her at all. At last they came to the country which we now call Greece. It was a new country then, and only a few people lived there, but Cadmus soon learned to speak their language well. For a long time he wandered from one little town to another, always telling the story of his lost sister. 2. The Pythia One day an old man told Cadmus that if he would go to the Delphi and ask the Pythia, perhaps she could tell him all about Europa. Cadmus had never heard of Delphi or of the Pythia, and he asked the old man what he meant. "'I will tell you,' said the man. Delphi is a town, built near the foot of Mount Parnassus, at the very centre of the earth. It is the town of Apollo, the bringer of light, and there is a temple there, built close to the spot where Apollo killed a black serpent many, many years ago. The temple is the most wonderful place in the world. In the middle of the floor there is a wide crack or crevice, and this crevice goes down, down into the rock. Nobody knows how deep. A strange odor comes up out of the crevice, and if anyone breathes much of it, he is apt to fall over and lose his senses. But who is the Pythia that you spoke about? asked Cadmus. I will tell you, said the old man. The Pythia is a wise woman who lives in the temple. When anybody asks her a hard question, she takes a three-legged stool, called a tripod, and sets it over the crevice in the floor. Then she sits on the stool and breathes the strange odor, and instead of losing her senses, as other people would do, she talks with Apollo, and Apollo tells her how to answer the question. Men from all parts of the world go there to ask about things which they would like to know. The temple is full of the beautiful and costly gifts which they have brought for the Pythia. Sometimes she answers them plainly, and sometimes she answers them in riddles, but what she says always comes true. So Cadmus went to the Delphi to ask the Pythia about his lost sister. The wise woman was very kind to him and when he had given her a beautiful golden cup to pay her for her trouble she sat down on the tripod and breathed the strange odour which came up through the crevice in the rock then her face grew pale and her eyes looked wild and she seemed to be in great pain but they said that she was talking with apollo cadmus asked her to tell him what had become of europa she said that jupiter in the form of a white bull, had carried her away, and that it would be of no use to look for her any more. "'But what shall I do?' said Cadmus. "'My father told me not to turn back till I should find her.' "'Your father is dead,' said the Pythia, "'and a strange king rules in his place. You must stay in Greece, for there is work here for you to do.' "'What must I do?' said Cadmus. Follow the white cow, said the Pythia, and on the hill where she lies down you must build a city. Cadmus did not understand what she meant by this, but she would not speak another word. This must be one of her riddles, he said, and he left the temple. 3. The Dragon when Cadmus went out of the temple, he saw a snow-white cow standing not far from the door. She seemed to be waiting for him, for she looked at him with her large brown eyes, and then turned and walked away. 
Cadmus thought of what the Pythia had just told him, and so he followed her. All day and all night he walked through a strange wild country where no one lived, and two of the young men who had sailed with Cadmus from his old home were with him. When the sun rose the next morning, they saw that they were on the top of a beautiful hill, with woods on one side and a grassy meadow on the other. There the cow lay down. "'Here we will build our city,' said Cadmus. Then the young men made a fire of dry sticks, and Cadmus killed the cow. They thought that if they should burn some of her flesh, the smell of it would go up to the sky and be pleasing to Jupiter and the mighty folk who lived with him among the clouds. And in this way they hoped to make friends with Jupiter, so that he would not hinder them in their work but they needed water to wash the flesh and their hands, and so one of the young men went down the hill to find some. He was gone so long that the other young man became uneasy and went after him. Cadmus waited for them till the fire had burned low. He waited and waited till the sun was high in the sky. He called and shouted, but no one answered him. At last he took his sword in his hand and went down to see what was the matter. He followed the path which his friends had taken, and soon came to a fine stream of cold water at the foot of a hill. He saw something move among the bushes which grew near it. It was a fierce dragon waiting to spring upon him. There was blood on the grass and leaves, and it was not hard to guess what had become of the two young men. The beast sprang at Cadmus and tried to seize him with its sharp claws. But Cadmus leaped quickly aside and struck it in the neck with his long sword. A great stream of black blood gushed out, and the dragon soon fell to the ground, dead. Cadmus had seen many fearful sights, but never anything as dreadful as this beast. He had never been in so great danger before. He sat down on the ground and trembled, and all the time he was weeping for his two friends. How now was he to build a city, with no one to help him? 4. THE CITY While Cadmus was still weeping, he was surprised to hear someone calling him. He stood up and looked round. On the hillside before him was a tall woman who had a helmet on her head and a shield in her hand. Her eyes were grey, and her face, though not beautiful, was very noble. Cadmus knew at once that she was Athena, the queen of the air, she who gives wisdom to men. Athena told Cadmus that he must take out the teeth of the dragon and sow them in the ground. He thought that would be a queer kind of seed, but she said that if he would do this, he would soon have men enough to help him build his city, and, before he could say a word, she had gone out of his sight. The dragon had a great many teeth, so many that when Cadmus had taken them out they filled his helmet heaping full. The next thing was to find a good place to sow them. Just as he turned away from the stream he saw a yoke of oxen standing a little way off. He went to them and found that they were hitched to a plough. What more could he want? The ground in the meadow was soft and black and he drove the plough up and down, making long furrows, as he went. Then he dropped the teeth, one by one, into the furrows, and covered them over with a rich soil. When he had sown all of them in this way, he sat down on the hillside and watched to see what would happen. In a little while the soil in the furrows began to steer. Then. At every place that a tooth had been dropped, something bright grew up. It was a brass helmet. The helmets pushed their way up, and soon the faces of men were seen underneath, then their shoulders, then their arms, then their bodies. And then, before Cadmus could think, a thousand warriors leaped out of the furrows and shook off the black earth which was clinging to them. Every man was clothed in a suit of brass armor, and every one had a long spear in his right hand and a shield in his left. Cadmus was frightened when he saw the strange crop which had grown up from the dragon's teeth. 
The man looked so fierce that he feared they would kill him if they saw him. He hid himself behind his plough, and then began to throw stones at them. The warriors did not know where the stones came from, but each thought that his neighbour had struck him. Soon they began to fight among themselves. Man after man was killed, and in a little while only five were left alive. Then Cadmus ran towards them and called out, Hold! Stop fighting! You are my men and must come with me. We will build a city here. The men obeyed him. They followed Cadmus to the top of the hill, and they were such good workmen that in a few days they had built a house on the spot where the cow had lain down. After that they built other houses, and people came to live in them. They called the town Cadmea, after Cadmus, who was its first king. But when the place had grown to be a large city, it was known by the name of Thebes. Cadmus was a wise king. The mighty folk who lived with Jupiter amid the clouds were well pleased with him, and helped him in more ways than one. After a while he married Ammonia, the beautiful daughter of Mars. All the mighty ones were at the wedding, and Athena gave the bride a wonderful necklace, about which you may learn something more at another time. But the greatest thing that Cadmus did is yet to be told. He was the first schoolmaster of the Greeks, and taught them the letters which were used in his own country across the sea. They called the first of these letters Alpha, and the second Beta, and that is why men speak of the alphabet to this day. And when the Greeks had learned the alphabet from Cadmus, they soon began to read and write, and to make beautiful and useful books. As for the maiden Europa, she was carried safe over the sea to a distant shore. She may have been happy in the new, strange land to which she was taken, I cannot tell, but she never heard of friends or home again. Whether it was really Jupiter in the form of a bull that carried her away, nobody knows. It all happened so long ago that there may have been some mistake about the story, and I should not think it strange if it were a sea-robber who stole her from her home, and a swift ship with wide sails that bore her away. Of one thing I am very sure. She was loved so well by all who knew her that the great unknown country to which she was taken has been called after her name ever since, Europe. End of section 9 Recording by Sandra Luna